Hey everyone, it's Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and welcome back to another episode of the Rugged Edge Survival Guide, a premio podcast. Again, I'm your host, Daniel Litwin. Thank you so much for joining us on another episode of the show as we explore important technologies, changes, and plans of action for making the most of edge computing. As we dig into today's topic, I want to make sure you're all caught up on our previous conversations. So make sure you're heading to our website, premioinc.com. Again, that's premioinc.com. There you'll find previous conversations of the podcast, as well as other articles, videos, blogs, resources and information on our solutions and services. You can also subscribe to the Rugged Edge Survival Guide on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Just hit that subscribe button and you'll have a full catalog of previous conversations plus notifications when we drop new episodes. So today we're going to be doing a bit of a hardware edition of the show as we lay out everything that you need to know about designing an AI edge inference computer. We're going to be getting to the nuts and bolts of power specs, storage specs, upgrade strategies, and use case scenarios that will make sure that as you level up your edge compute capacity, you do so thoughtfully and effectively with the current market trends in mind and the best strategies to deliver on results. So, per usual, we're joined by our frequent guest, Mr. Dustin C2, Director of Product Marketing at Premio. Dustin, great to have you on. How you doing? I'm doing well. Uh, everything is going well. Hope. How are you doing, Daniel? Hey, man, I'm doing well as well. Thank you for asking. Uh, it's always cool. a busy time, um, but I know your industry is uh, you know, being met with a lot of exciting opportunity and challenges and you're meeting it head on. So thanks again for taking some time to walk us through these updates and some actionable strategies so our audience can make the most of AI edge inference computing power. Uh, I want to start by, I guess, laying out some background and some context so our audience understands why we're even having this conversation in the first place. So. Can you give us that background on where the AI edge inference market is at today and how uh, compute power is pushing use cases and the industry at large forward, right? Like what should we keep in mind about current developments as we talk this out? Sure. So I think being in the industry or premium being in the industry for the last three years um, heavily revolved around a lot of the compute architecture and a lot of our products that we've helped shape into a lot of these applications that continually grow, right? And things that are trending in IoT, big data, cloud compute. And now what's at the forefront is really what edge compute is kind of all about. Uh, but I think in the last few, I would say three to five years, um, a lot of that has been brought to the mainstream media for a lot of reasons. Um, and one of those reasons currently really is this shortage of these semiconductors, these microchips that are basically um, at the core level of every electronic devices that we go through in our daily lives. Um, but more importantly than a shortage of this, uh, the technology behind these uh, microchips or these semiconductors is a pivotal shift for what we need from technology. And that shift is really um, from centralized compute all the way to you know, more distributed compute in the overall network architect uh, architecture. Right. So um, at the core level, what's driving a lot of this shift really is this insatiable demand for compute power. And with that compute power, again, you know, what is at the core of a lot of this compute architecture? And, you know, with that, there's a lot of these semiconductors. And then within these semiconductors, a lot of that is driven in a lot of the core technologies in like central processing units, which are your CPUs. You know, your GPUs, your M2 accelerators, even like NAND uh, flash storage. And a lot of that and a lot of that technology put together is basically what's consolidating and culminating into a future of machine learning and artificial intelligence. So some cool facts um, that I've been following if you're kind of in the industry and, you know, how this has been grown into popularity. Um, so Garner um, recently released their their report of 2021 and the overall market for semiconductors. Uh, the first time it pushed past about $500 billion and around 583, right? And a lot of that demand was really coming from uh, this new 5G growth development deployments for smartphones, but really on the backbone of this continuous 
evolution and growth of you know PC markets and compute, right? That's all compute. Um, so overall, I think why that in, that report is very important is that it really shows the importance of compute. Um, but really, as time continues to grow, you know, by the end of the decade, I mean, that market's going to grow from even five billion projected to grow to be even you know uh, one trillion. Um, so in addition to some of those things, right, there's major news investments from the government and, you know, major enterprise companies that realize that this is a major importance for a lot of our growth in technology. So you'll, I mean, most people are starting to hear there are these major investments, you know, in the CHIPS acts where the government is basically putting, you know, investments, subsidies back into uh, companies for them to invest in the growth of semiconductors in you know, uh, manufacturing facilities here in the U.S. So, you know, some of those major news stories, I mean, Intel is a very great example. I mean, Intel is an American company. Uh, they have a main focus in semiconductors, although they, you know, have a global supply chain, they actually even understand to pull some of that capacity storage here in the United States. And they are actually, you know, in the process of building two major fabs in, you know, Arizona, also in uh, Ohio as well. So, I think it's quite evident, right, with all this explosion of compute, all this demand for capacity, uh, the compute layer of all of this technology is, is very important. And as we make that shift from centralized compute out to the network edge, you are going to need you know, better compute, faster compute, and more reliable resources to interact with that data. Um, so I think... One thing that I, I like to follow, and I think uh, when I mentioned Intel, I kind of follow a lot of what their leadership is saying to kind of get a gauge and pulse of where the market is going. And I think uh, their CEO, Pat uh, Gelsinger, you know, he mentioned something that was very interesting to me is that he mentioned that we're in the golden age of semiconductors. And we are actually really are in the golden age of semiconductors because we're at this tipping point. All right? we, we realize that there's all, there's, all, there's all this compute power necessary that's driving these machine learning models. It's, it's driving artificial intelligence. And what he called um, this this element and this 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 market is really dictated by what he said is technology superpowers. And there's four key elements of why these technology superpowers are important. Uh, number one being ubiquitous compute, so being able to really interact with technology anywhere. Second would be the cloud to edge infrastructure, right? So moving this 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 traditional cloud compute power out to the edge where there's data being generated, interact with that data, make real time decisions. Um, with low latency and higher bandwidth is very important. Uh, third is the pervasive c connectivity. So, you know, even with wireless c connectivity, uh, everyone is actually able to connect. Even this podcast, we're able to connect through a lot of this connectivity. And last but not least um, is really what the future of all this compute power and these workloads are doing is driving these uh, artificial intelligence models to really push forward to a you know, level of automation. I appreciate all that background info. Uh, hopefully with sure. that, too, our audience now gets a better sense for why we're even having this conversation. Uh, so, folks, there is a lot of opportunity to make compute power work for your edge needs. And so what we're wanting to do now is lay out those strategies for how you can uh, connect the dots and how you can build out your AI edge inference computer to have the right specs, the right storage, the right power to meet the current demands of the market. So let's get into those strategies, Dustin. Uh, we'll start with a simple question. It might seem a little elementary, but I kind of just want to get your definition. What is an AI edge inference computer? And maybe explain that in practice too, so we really get the right understanding of what we're talking about. Yeah, so it really, the reason why I wanted to kind of use um, Pat Gelsinger's like technology superpower as a leading point, because they're very key principles of what he's mentioning that really kind of culminate into the overall design of an AI edge inference computer, right? So those, those four technology superpowers are really at the forefront of these industries that's driving a digital transformation. And a lot of this goes into the design for better performance, better power efficiency, looking at the overall thermal mechanics to, you know, develop a system that is lower in power as you push to these remote and mobile environments, what we are calling as rugged edge computing. Um, so in our definition, um, it's very fitting to be calling it an AI edge inference computer because a lot of the future workloads really stem into developing a hardware solution that culminates all these different technologies to re really able to interact with these new AI workloads. 
Um, so essentially what we're doing um, and why it's so important is these AI edge inference computers are moving into a market of what we are defining as rugged edge computing. And really in this market, there's this convergence of all these technologies from, you know, compute processing, high performance storage, wireless connectivity, but all that doesn't work in an environment that is harsh, an environment that is not as stable. So you need to really understand how to ruggedize the product and harden the product in order for it to be reliable and survive in this. So how we do that is um, we look at the overall system level architecture and that's where our engineering really comes into play because we really are able to balance uh, the necessary compute power, look at the overall power efficiency, uh, balance out or uh, look at the actual tests for the ruggedization of the product and then basically uh, put that together and you know deploy for a lot of these newer applications that are closer to these these IoT sensors as well. And how, how that works in, in practice, right? Why that works is um, when you have all this type of technology in close proximity to where data is being generated, you really can now start to do the decision making. You really do have the ability to in interact and manipulate with that data with uh, efficient intelligence and with cognitive ability that's written into these software codes. If you had to do a compare contrast with other um, computer platforms, what is the key differentiator of an AI edge inference computer? Yeah, so um, there's a few key differentiators I'll go into, uh, but I really want to kind of explain the design realization that came into this product that we are pushing into the market. And the reason why we're able to do that is where Premio sits um, in, in our engineering and our design of our computer architectures, we have two different design teams. Uh, one design team is strictly focused in the embedded market and the embedded market traditionally for over you know, the last 20 plus years, whatever, um, has always been focused in putting together uh, you know, hardware solutions that are low power, usually passively cooled, that are fit for very harsh environments that have reliability, endurance, and I.O. Uh, variety. Uh, on the flip side of that, you also have um, the high performance data center type of design. And in the data center, you do have controlled resources. So the ultimate goal there is to maximize the performance. And by maximizing performance, you're putting an enormous, enormous, enormous amount of uh, hardware in order to make sure you're having, you know, um, high bandwidth in very extreme amounts of performance, leveraging the latest in a lot of these, you know, uh, you know, PCIe lanes specifically. So kind of in summary, when you take those two design principles together, you kind of have that middle ground. And that's what we decided in our AI edge inference computer is to kind of balance uh, a little bit of the, the embedded know-how and the high performance um, and kind of put that together into a single product that we believe fits well for a lot of the data interaction and data that's uh, being processed at the edge in real time. Um, so to kind of dive into some of the key differences that makes our AI edge inference computer different is we actually made it modular, right? So a lot of the, the solutions out there are a single piece um, design that in order to make any changes, you actually have to wait to the next generation. Uh, one key element that we wanted to offer the flexibility of our customers is that we made um, certain elements of the hardware or the computer modular and the top portion, which we're calling our top node uses our traditional x86 fanless industrial grade design. And that basically gives you the processing, gives you all the, the IO connectivity that can interact with all these sensors. But what's a key differentiator in this specific AI edge inference computer is in the bottom node. And then in, in these bottom nodes, what we're calling them is our edge boost nodes. And these edge boost nodes um, are scalable in the sense that they offer the customer flexibility based on their application workload to deliver performance acceleration. Right. So performance acceleration is extremely important when it comes to inference, because that is where you're able to leverage the hardware with the software that you've written to really deliver a real time uh, inference based on machine intelligence or you know, artificial intelligence specifically. You laid out some great context for us earlier on the market motivators that are uh, pushing the need for AI at the edge. Uh, and how Compute Power is uh, supporting that push. Uh, but could you get a little bit more specific on some of the use cases and applications that are really winning out or making the best uh, case 
for uh, AI edge inference compute? Um, what are those key applications you see it being used for today? Yeah, so the, the main benefit of having an AI edge inference computer is exactly with mentioning in that paradigm shift of being able to interact with data and this shift away from centralized compute into more um, a, a localized compute where data can be acted in real time. So um, really, I believe the best applications for AI inference computer are really focused on that keyword of inference, right? And why inference is so important, which is different um, than like a deep learning model is that the inference AI has already been trained to a level of intelligence and intellig or a level of cognitive ability um, where now it's able to look at that data, interact with that data and decipher that data very quickly and not use that data to actually learn about anything. It's a decision making principle. Whereas in if you're using the data for a deep learning model, um, the data sets have to be quite large and you need a lot of horsepower to actually train the machines to get to a level of some type of intelligence. So when I talk about inference, some of the, the most interesting use cases that we are starting to see our AI inference computer go into, number one, I would say the biggest one would be computer vision and industrial automation with robotics. Um, we have very interesting customers that are leveraging so much of our AI edge inference computer for their computer vision applications. Uh, essentially, they are connecting all these IoT sensors. They can be cameras um, in some type of automation align. And you can imagine, I think, in in, in this 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 last uh, in this current shortage that we're doing, a lot of the pain problems is being able to use automation to kind of solve a lot of the, the issues with short staffing and people who are not in like logistics warehouses and a lot of these newer applications are really trying to use computer vision to eliminate a lot of that. So um, being able to recognize different objects coming off the line with computer vision, object detection, image detection, um, even we have some customers using AI edge inference computers to basically navigate a lot of autonomous vehicles inside these logistic facilities, whether that be you know, autonomous forklifts, um, you know, some types of um, autonomous guided vehicles that are helping move different things throughout the, the, the automation facility. Um, a second one would be, a, sec a second application would be security and surveillance. I mean, that is actually a very good example of edge type of data interaction, right? Because it's still using a lot of this, a lot of different feeds from a lot of different cameras coming into a centralized location. And that inference is able to actually do object detection or pose detection directly uh, from the camera feeds that are coming in uh, from, from the cameras as well. Um, another last major application that we're starting to see growth into is in the ADAS and autonomous vehicles. Um, so in this environment already, you can imagine you need to have extremely fast decision making because vehicles that are on the road need to be able to not only detect uh, and decipher their environment, but they need to be able to recognize and kind of pivot based on where the car is going. So in addition, this, these AI edge inference computers are being used to kind of still pull a lot of the data that's being driven in these test vehicles to actually move back into um, the cloud to do a little bit more deep learning. Cause we're definitely not at the level of full autonomous driving. There's a lot of applications that are still trying to pull a lot of the data kind of train and make these 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 models a lot smarter and these AI edge inference computers are able to kind of leverage all that in a lot of the um, technologies that we're putting to to the, in the product itself now naturally the whole show is called the rugged edge survival guide we've done several uh, deep dives into the rugged edge compared to just the edge and I guess just as a quick refresher when we talk rugged we're talking uh, some of the edge deployments that are under the most strenuous conditions, whether those are environmental, uh, you know, the use case itself is just really pushing the limits of what uh, the compute platform can achieve. And so with that as context, how do you see the rugged edge being part of what is um, shaping AI edge inference computing? And why do we need to strategize around the edge versus the rugged edge differently in this scenario? Yeah, so um, the ruggedization of the product is very important for AI workloads that are usually in areas that are remote and mobile. 
Um, so when you look at the overall system of the product, um, reliability and durability is extremely important. So, you know, being able to deploy products in, you know, wide temperature ranges or uh, environments that are dealing with, you know, water or power like area or environments where the power is actually not so stable, you know, those defining environmental challenges are things that we need to actually develop and look into the overall system design because we understand some of um, our customers' applications are in these extreme environments. So, for example, they can be, you know, in an underground mining environment where, you know, safety is a major factor or where, um, you know, they necessarily, you know, are using autonomous type of applications in an underground mining environment to kind of navigate or map out the whole environment. Um, another one would be, you know, in oil and gas, right? Oil and gas is where uh, it's oftentimes in environments where it's, it's quite, um, you know, dirty, rugged, harsh, and you need something that's going to continuously be reliable as well. So um, really, I mean, this, this, this question really dives into really understanding how do we ensure the product maintains its reliability um, you know, 24 seven in these environments. And how we do that is we test the product to extremes in our um, test with our test equipment. And then we are able to kind of push the product um, extremely well. And for these applications. So let's start to break down some of the specific specs then that our audience needs to keep in mind as they build out their AI edge inference computer. Uh, let's talk storage. First, what storage options are available today? What's sort of the um, the standard that you recommend? And are there trade-offs associated with each kind of storage option? Yeah, so this, this question is a good question specifically um, as a differentiator for the, our AI Edge inference computer. Um, so if you look at storage as a whole, um, it's very important because it's clear that capacity of overall storage is key. Um, but it's quite evident that if, as you move further away from a data center and you have less and less, less, um, resources for large amounts of storage, you need to be able to deliver, um, different storage protocols or different elements of storage in a localized box that's able to still deliver, you know, uh, the performance required, um, so if you look at overall storage media itself, I think the growth in technology is quite evident because you're starting to see more of these NAND flash layers, whether it be, you know, MLC, QLC, TLC capacities. And, you know, by adding these different layers, um, you're increasing the overall capacity, but also, um, there are also, there is a level of endurance required, but, um, as you move out to the edge, one of the major bottlenecks and challenges traditionally in a lot of this embedded compute is um, you were stuck at a SATA protocol and the SATA protocol itself is limited by the read and write speeds of, you know, six gigabit. So what we're doing differently and what we're actually bringing to the market first um, in our AI edge inference computer is the ability to have high capacity NVMe storage in our um, canister bricks. And it's not that we're introducing MVME um, into, uh, you know, embedded computers first. What we're doing differently is we're actually making MVME in uh, hot swappable two and a half inch drive trays, um, you know, whether it be M2, U2, and you're now able to deliver uh, MVME in, with incredible high read and write speeds, but also high outputs or, uh, in, or high uh, IOPS. So what that does is that now allows the computer in to interact with that data um, extremely fast. You're able to kind of store that data, but most importantly, you can actually take a lot of that data that's stored on the computer and move it off that device very quickly. And now into a, uh, another environment, say the cloud to where you actually can do a little bit more of that machine learning. Is there something that our audience should keep in mind about uh, how to choose the right storage for them, right? Is there, uh, you know, anything to do with the, uh, you know, the maker of the various uh, storage hardware, um, perhaps the specs and how they match to the actual use case? What questions should they be yeah. asking themselves to answer that correctly for themselves? So it, it really, I mean, from what well, our goal is to offer different varieties of storage. So whether 
I mean, capacity in SATA storage or, you know, high performance NVMe, um, they have those options, but to kind of answer your question more directly, um, in a lot of these rugged environments, um, you need to have um, storage media that's also been tested for you know wide temperatures as well. So we we do offer uh, tested and validated vendors that work with uh, wide temperature storage that can actually work in the box. So when you are in an environment um, where it, the temperature is, is quite wide in range, um, you still can retain a, a read and write endurance and reliability. Um, in these different storage medias. All right, let's go ahead and chat power efficiency now and, um, you know, I guess how to align the actual horsepower that you need in your compute platform to meet uh, AI use cases that are um, most common. So I guess first off, why would you say power efficiency is such a key spec in AI edge inference computing? Uh, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, so... It's all about um, being able to deliver the right amount of power with the performance budget, right? So on one side of the picture, um, it's really easy to kind of put together all these different powerful components. Um, and if you actually deploy it, if it's using a lot of power it's, and it's not being efficient, that's actually not going to be the best solution for the customer or the application. So what we need to do is we need to be very selective and evaluate certain components that really meet the performance benchmark, but also are still power efficient. And why it's so important to be power efficient, again, is like when you're at the edge, you don't have the resources, you don't have um, the, the raw liable power constantly there. So you need to find ways to actually do um, power efficiency as a whole. So. Um, one major way we're able to reduce the power efficiency is through um, the cooling methods, right? So um, one major element and what we put, we try to put in a lot of our ruggedized uh, computing design is you looking at the product and using a passive cooling method. And lots of times passive cooling methods results in using a fanless design that uses the thermal mechanics behind heat sinks to basically dissipate the heat away from a lot of these critical components. So by actually removing a lot of the, like an active fan, that's another power, uh, a power element that actually is removed from the design. Um, but essentially what's another, what's also important is you need to understand the environment that the product is going to. Once you have a balance of this performance and power, um, you also now need to be able to support the product in an environment where power can actually be quite wide in terms of fluctuation. So what we've done is we still maintain our rugged power in terms of our wide power input. So, um, you know, it, it, like I mentioned in the top node, you're still able to do a wide power input from like nine volt to 50 volt DC. Um, but what's very interestingly different in the IH inference computer is that on even on the bottom node, when you have high performance GPU, NVMe storage, and M2 accelerators that are traditionally naturally, you know, using a lot of power, um, we're still able to deliver a secondary power source still in a wide power range from like 12 to 48 volt DC. And then additionally to that is when you have these, you know, extremely amounts of uh, performance accelerators, of GPU and maybe storage, um, we actually on the bottom node included a hot swappable um, high RPM fan. And this fan itself is only dedicated for the edge boost nodes and their accelerators because um, when you actually include these type of performance accelerators, you need the ability to cool that, right? So it's that balance, like I mentioned earlier, is understanding of low power efficiency, but still incorporating, you know, the high performance data center type of application or data center type of technologies and meeting in the middle to still provide a pretty robust uh, AI edge inference computer. So then same question to the last spec uh, of storage, but what should um, our audience be asking themselves as they maneuver decisions around the right uh, power specs and power efficiency specs to meet their needs? Yeah, so it's really about understanding, I think, their, their, their application on what they're going to be using. Again, the, the computer itself is extremely rugged um, to where it can support a lot of uh, major applications because if you know, we've already, as our knowledge and know-how of hardware engineering, we've done our best 
and based on our, our benchmarks and tests to deliver a product and solution um, that will deliver that performance to power ratio. So um, you can almost you can almost guarantee that you know we've selected the best type of component, the best type of processing, the best type of performance accelerator with a low power efficient uh, model to where it's actually going to be a best bang for the total cost of the overall solution. Now let's talk upgrades. Um, now this is critically important because uh, as you laid out in your introduction, this industry is evolving constantly. Uh, not only are the needs for uh, AI at the edge evolving and new use cases popping up uh, every year, but also the hardware itself upgrades and gets more powerful and you know creates a chicken and egg scenario of as one upgrades it pushes uh, the use cases forward and as the use cases forward uh, then the uh, hardware has new opportunities to push itself forward as well right so in this dynamic naturally there will be upgrades to systems so what are your thoughts there how can upgrades occur in an AI edge inference computer and do you have any key strategies yeah good question so I think from the, the embedded side of the market and how we've looked at next generational upgrades has always been very strategic. And I think what's on the consumer side of high performance and the latest and greatest, um, the embedded market is actually a few, a few not years behind, but it's a little generations behind for the reason of the ability to ensure um, you want to have the necessary compute power for the customer to leverage without moving too quickly to a solution or a generation, potentially there could be bugs early on in a lot of the deployment. Um, so with that challenge and that on the embedded side, what we're always trying to look at is how do we come up with a timely solution that allows the customer to scale, allow the customer to stay competitive in their application, whether that be in all of the different types of technologies and hardware, memory, storage, connectivity. Um, but with, like you mentioned, and the technology continues to move so fast. So that's like a, one of the major challenges um, our customers are dealing with. And they're always looking to kind of be the latest and greatest, um, you know, in their type of deployment. So one of the major elements and the benefits um, that has been timely in a lot of this embedded computing design and always been helpful is finding out a way to make it modular, right? So the idea of making simple things modular and really allowing the customer to upgrade um, very quickly is actually very key. So what we did differently in this AI edge inference computer is um, we've made the compute module top node modular and we have performance acceleration, acceleration modules in our edge boost nodes um, that can mix and match. So a very simple example is this current generation of AI edge inference computer is on a Intel ninth gen um, core CPU, right? So with the next generation that we release, it really is a quick uh, swap of the top node and you can still leverage all the performance acceleration through the edge boost nodes. And that is continuously going to happen as we increase the next generation design. And the benefit for that is the customer in the field can now make that swap extremely efficient with the modularity rather than completely just swapping the whole entire unit. Are there any, um, you know, cost factors or budgeting of upgrades that our audience should keep in mind as they uh, plan out their AI edge inference computing launch? Yeah, so there's two things to look at. Um, from a cost standpoint, by making it a modular, um, it does increase the overall cost just a little bit. But I mean, overall costs in the last year or so for components are also going up. But really, I think it's mostly important to look at cost as the total cost of the ownership. So by able to make this modular, although it might increase the overall cost a bit, but in the long run, it really helps um, the customer and, and their applications be you know, um, efficient in the latest generation of compute. As technology continues to grow extremely uh, fast with these newer technologies that are pushing you know, machine learning and AI workloads. All right, Dustin, I appreciate all of the breakdown so far. We've got a few more questions here for you. Um, let's talk potential challenges that might pop up here. So are there any uh, key challenges that you think uh, an OEM may come across that they should keep in mind when integrating an AI edge inference computer? And how do you get past those challenges? Why does that matter in our larger conversation? So strictly speaking, from a, from a hardware perspective, 
Um, I think one of the greatest challenges that a lot of the OEM customers that we're dealing with is uh, making sure that their software application is ported on to the hardware in a very streamlined manner. Um, I would say to us, it's a challenge because we don't really understand uh, what the customer is using in terms of their software. Um, we essentially, our goal is to really put together a robust, reliable hardware solution that is um, elementary in the sense of the baseline of Windows or Linux to where the customer can now take that and integrate very quickly, streamlessly into their deployment use cases. Um, but I would say another interesting feature that this product actually has is uh, we really try to do everything possible to make uh, the integration for the customer's software application very uh, seamless. So we've also developed um, a, a software development kit um, that interacts with the hardware and certain parts of the hardware that are very important. So everything from uh, the overall fan speed, um, the overall ambient temperature, and all of this is, is programmable through um, an API or a software development kit that we offer for the customers. Um, strictly speaking, in the development kit, one thing that's very also important is uh, we've included a programmable logic um, that allows to allows the NVMe canister bricks to actually suspend their IO operations with the click of a button. And this is all can be programmable based on what the customer's application. So they have uh, they have programmable logic on what they want to do with that. But essentially the overall function of this and why it's so important is that um, in data storage, while there's a lot of inputs and outputs coming through the computer, for example, if you needed to kind of eject the physical NVMe canister brick with a click of a button, uh, we can actually suspend any IO operations. So this actually retains the data storage, uh, but also prevents a lot of the data corruption that can happen within this, you know, back and forth of data reading. All right, Dustin, last but not least, we're going to toss Premio into the conversation here. How do Premio's offerings in the AI edge compute world differ from the rest of the market and what is uh, particularly practical and applicable about those differences based on everything we just laid out? Um, so I think one of the defining features of uh, our competitor, competitive differences as so as the manufacturer, um, we always are trying to find innovative ways to help our customers be as flexible and agile in their overall deployments. And I think in this whole conversation, I th it's, it's been quite evident that in our new AI edge inference computer and how we've made a pivot and change into overall the modularity of the design um, by also introducing our edge boost nodes that are purpose built for the edge in terms of performance acceleration in GPU acceleration, uh, MVME, you know, storage and M2 acceleration um, that really allows our customers to leverage a purpose-built solution directly fit for these newer applications at the edge. Um, ultimately, what we've done is, you know, we've looked at some of the biggest challenges from a hardware side and pretty much, you know, put that together and solve that in an off-the-shelf solution. So what we've been able to do from a compute standpoint is really balance the performance, look at the overall reliability, employ data security, leverage a overall power budget, in a new and sophisticated um, industrial design that now allows um, these, these, these applications to be successful when they're deployed. All right, Dustin, any final thoughts then in summary, any actionable tips for our audience to uh, begin to make sense of everything we laid out and turn that into some immediate steps for either upgrading or beginning to decide their design specs for an AI edge inference computer? Yeah, so I think the only takeaway is, you know, a lot of this this market continues to grow um, and we need to be able to leverage an ecosystem. And that ecosystem heavily relies around a lot of different type of innovators in semiconductors, uh, ecosystem partners that really push the overall solution to uh, the full deployment for the end user. So, um, you know, really understanding the capabilities of engineering, uh, the manufacturing of the product and really pushing the product to, um, you know, full deployment is, is what Premio is constantly trying to solve for a lot of our customers and their applications. 
And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap up this hardware edition of the podcast. Dustin C2, Director of Product Marketing at Premio. Thank you so much for your time today and breaking down for us uh, you know, the current context that's motivating compute power uh, being a core driver of new AI edge inference capabilities and laying out some spec strategies for our audience. Uh, if folks want to ask any questions, maybe they want to follow up with you on any of the topics we broke down, or they just want more information on how Premio meets some of these uh, AI edge compute needs, how can they get in touch? How can they learn more? Yeah, the best source would be to access our website, www.premioinc.com. Uh, we have a lot of educational content from our case studies. We have white papers. Uh, we even have an ebook um, that you can kind of dive in to learn more about rugged edge computing. Um, but if you don't like to read all that information, we also launched something that's extremely new uh, for video content and podcasts. So you can also check out our Rugged Edge Media Hub, uh, where we have all the latest information related to rugged edge computing for you at your fingertips. Love it. An omni-channel approach to content. That's the best way. All right, Dustin, thank you for your time. It was always uh, you know, a pleasure getting to chat, and we'll talk again soon. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. Have a great one. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of the Rugged Edge Survival Guide, a premium podcast. If you like what you heard and saw today and you want to tap into some previous episodes or you just want more resources on the topic, make sure that you're heading to our website, premioinc.com. Again, that's premioinc.com. And make sure you're subscribing to the Rugged Edge Survival Guide on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. I'm your host, Daniel Litwin, the voice of B2B, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Rugged Edge Survival Guide.